Hello ladies, welcome to Housekeeping Radio. I want to include the widows and the women who don't have their own house to keep anymore or, or are looking forward to it and still would enjoy hearing about homemaking. So I'm just calling it Housekeeping Radio for now. And it's a place where you can listen while you work. There isn't anything to watch. I'm not going to de um, demonstrate anything. And of course, I love watching videos about making things and about housekeeping ideas and I uh, but I have to stop and look at them and I want to create create an area where you can listen as you go but before you go I'd like to show you my teacup of the day and it is uh, another one from TJ Maxx this one was $6.99 and this is the last of my collection so what I'm going to do is begin again and uh, maybe do some sewing and use some of my fabric that has these delightful prints on them to go with the teacup and give me a chance to get into my fabric stash and get that done which has been an ambition of mine for a couple of years and this one is by Steck Hall Gracie Bone China I think it's absolutely beautiful you know, I told you that TJ Maxx, Home Goods, and Marshalls were going up in their prices. Well, the other day, uh, we noticed that they were back down to $6.99. I think if they've got gold on them, they're going to be twice as high. So, anyway, I'll get a picture of that and put it on my blog. And if you are new here, there are no comments on YouTube because I'm really not playing around with YouTube. I don't need more social media. I'm making these for my blog and they go with what I'm doing over there so I'd like you to go over there I'll provide a link and you can leave a comment over there and see what else uh, is going on and go look at some of the other homemakers and uh, then you can also get if you'll sign up and get the subscription then you will also get things that are not uh, videos but are just pictures and other things that I'm doing maybe some things that I'm making and you can look at them so the purpose of this is to provide support for the homemaker because homemaking is isolating. It's, something, it's one of those jobs that cannot be done in a group. It does become isolating. A lot of people have said that, oh, it's lonely. Well, I know for sure that it's more isolating. Because if it were lonely, you could just go visit someone or have someone over. But uh, most of the time, they are in the way and you can't get anything done. So the feeling of isolation is one that is pretty normal because homemaking is just one of those jobs that you cannot do in a group. It just doesn't work the same. And anytime you try to do something in a group, it seems like it, it waters it down. It's, it uh, is not as effective. And, uh, you know, if you've ever worked with any kind of a group to do something, like put on any kind of hospitality and you have to work with a group, it's just more tedious to go through more people to get anything done. And um, it depends on what kind of group. If it's your family and it's your children and you assign one to do something and one to do the other individually, you might be able to get it done faster. But I believe that homemaking is one of those isolating jobs. And a lot of people could relate to it who have ended up in places that are very isolating and still manage to, to uh, thrive there. So this is quite a challenge. It's almost pioneerish, isn't it? And so today I'm just, I've got my picture my little list with words <laughs> that's supposed to trigger my memory which might not always or might give me the wrong words I don't know wrong thoughts so we want to I want to get into it and uh, start with um, your uh, your list make a list you know every day I get a piece of paper and I make a list on one side and then then my grocery list on the other side as I, or things that I you know as I'm going from room to room I have an apron I stick this in my pocket with a pen and as I'm going from room to room cleaning, I'll notice something that is that is needed. For instance, a box of Kleenex in the guest room. I'll just write that down and um, keep this list going all day. And so it's very handy and I can just stick it in my purse when I get ready to go. And so you want to get your list ready today. And then, you know, you really need to pray about what's on your list, that God would help you bring it all to success and fruition because... Nothing good can ever really be accomplished that's lasting unless uh, it's with the help of the Lord. And I really believe in prayer. And especially if you get up in the morning sometimes. Now, for some reason, homemaking 
inspires this more than any other type of occupation. And that is there are times you can get up in the morning and you, your mind goes blank and you walk around in a circle thinking, where do I start? And that's why you need a list because it can balance your thinking and your, your motivation. And one of the things I try to do on this housekeeping radio is to combine um, housekeeping and cleaning with creativity so that it's not so so dry and so um, so tedious or repetitive. And every day we do the same things, but they're not exactly the same. And it's hard to describe what a homemaker does. And sometimes people will challenge you and ask you, well, what is there to do all day? What I would like you to do sometime is take a little notebook and write down everything that you do, every tiny little thing that you do, because sometimes a list isn't all that we do. You may stop in the middle of something and clean up something that, uh, or find, maybe the other day I was working with a woman over at the meeting house, the church building, and we had moved uh, some seating, a seating area, and we were going to vacuum, and we noticed uh, a stain on the wall from ink or something. And so we had to stop and clean that off, even though our list didn't say that. So that's the type of thing that goes on in the home. You might notice that something needs repaired, or maybe a, a knob has fallen off of a, the kitchen cupboard or a, a dresser. You have to stop and put that on, and you will not notice that on your list. And people think you're not busy. And it is a, a lot of, it's a few major things, but then a lot of little things that go with it that no one ever notices that you do. So uh, make your list, have a prayer, and also I would say get your appearance ready because appearance is something that makes you feel that you are going uh, to do something important or that someone's coming or something's happening. And I know if you're really young, you could probably get away with getting out of bed, walking around in your pajamas and cleaning and you look just great. And... Uh, there's no problem, but as you get older, you need to pay more attention to how you look. And I'd like to discuss the word polish, because you can throw on anything, and you can even wear a skirt, a dress, and you can say, well, I'm wearing a dress, so that's real homemakey, that's very uh, feminine, and that's, you know, and, and my hair uh, looks feminine. But you know what, if it's not, if it doesn't have a polished look, uh, what is the point? It just looks um, it just looks disheveled, and uh, that's one of the complaints that people have about dresses is the people that they see wearing them uh, aren't polished. They don't look dignified. They're wearing skirts and dresses that aren't clean, that aren't pressed, that aren't uh, that have kind of gotten worn and lost their luster and uh, it, their crispness and their uh, the body, you know, and it's. Uh, Sometimes you just need to pay attention to your clothes and make yourself look more polished because I'm telling you, you might not think it matters at home, but you've got this job is dignified. And if you want to portray it to yourself as something that's really important, then dress and groom yourself in a polished way. Don't just throw your hair together and uh, your face together and your and, and and walk around looking sloppy because it isn't inspiring to your children. And it certainly isn't uh, very attractive to your husband or to anyone else. And, and maybe you don't think it matters because no one's going to see you. But that's really not true because remember Murphy's Law. And that is when you think something's not going to happen, that's the day it will happen. The day you decide you're going to just uh, laze around in your slippers and your robe is the day that everything happens and you're needed elsewhere and you have to go somewhere and you have to uh, get ready in such a hurry. If you'll get ready shortly after you wake up and you'll groom yourself and you'll dress and you'll just uh, try to look as nice as you can, then you're ready for anything and you don't have to take that extra step and get ready to go somewhere. You're ready even if you don't leave the house. It's best to be ready first thing. And so that, that way you don't have to make any adjustments when you're called out for some reason or other. And certainly all of us have been. So the polished appearance and I think it's really important. Uh, a lot of women at home, they're so selfless. They're, so, uh, they're such great um, caregivers and servants to their family that they don't think that they deserve to dress up and look nice. But 
you know, you should uh, take care of yourself first because then you will feel put together enough and not uh, distracted and, and not having your mind um, in parts all over the place. You, you, you're more focused and you can focus on looking after everyone else. And I think in order to do that, you've either got to get up a little bit earlier than everyone else, or you've got to take a break and make it known that this is your time that you're going to take care of yourself and uh, get ready for the day. So take care of yourself so that you can take care of others. Now, do you have trouble getting started? Well, there are several things that you can list that may help your you're making your list, uh, spending some time in prayer, spending some time walking. I, I have heard people say 10-minute walks, just 10-minute walks, and that that can settle your mind and get you focused. And uh, so homey life uh, starts with your appearance. And then, of course, your attitude will change as your appearance change. Everyone knows, even the most... Um, even people who are very professional in the professions and work with people and in hospitals and uh, other types of places where there are people that need help know that it helps a lot uh, if the patient is, has clean bedding and they're bathed and they have clean clothes on. This is so helpful in recovery. So if you're having a bit of a struggle and you need to recover from maybe a bad attitude, I would suggest getting dressed and getting dressed well. And it, it also helps if you raise your children to be to care about clothes. You know, if, if you just put your child in a pair of um, leggings and a t-shirt every day and, they, and it doesn't have any distinction, it's not pretty, um, they, won't, uh, they won't have the same feeling for clothing and throughout the Bible, we've noticed that it's, and I've talked about this in previous videos, where clothing was mentioned and clothing was important. In fact, I believe it was 30 changes of clothing for, as a reward for something in several instances. And so I would just in, emphasize uh, your clothing. Now, the, what I'm wearing today is a t-shirt that it's from um, Time and True brand from Walmart, 100% cotton getting harder to find the 100% cotton. I bought one the other day that I wasn't happy. I It had a lot of uh, acrylic in it, polyester, you know, uh, synthetic. Didn't really want to buy it, but I needed a long-sleeved uh, t-shirt so bad, so I went ahead and bought it. Well, after a few washings and wearings, uh, it began to bead up and look pretty bad and also did not feel very good. So I wouldn't suggest that, but if you can find the ones with 100% cotton, they're very, very uh, comfortable. And then I'm wearing a jacket that was given to me by someone, which I believe she probably got it at Ross. So let's get into the housekeeping now. And some of you kids have become very, very uh, secretive and naughty because you've been scrolling forward to the, to the people part. Because, of course, that's always more entertaining, you know, getting along with people that are trying to um, derail you and that you have to work around and uh, some of the attitudes that you run into in your life as a homemaker or anywhere. Uh, and so some of you are scrolling to the last 15 minutes trying to get that. And, uh, but, and I had thought about putting it first, but then that would kind of devalue the whole uh, homemaking and getting ready and and then you wouldn't get the lesson. So good luck in finding it <laughs> wherever I decide to put it today. And uh, so, but I, I have heard some of you say that you, you always scroll to the, uh, uh, to the part on handling people. <laughs> so, but you know, you can handle people yourself. All you have to do is observe. Just observe how some people act and observe what happened before, what happened afterwards, and whether this person um, behaves that way at certain times or with other people or what kind of pattern they show and after a while you'll figure out some things and that's all I've done and anyway it might not always apply in your life but I'll just share some of the amusing things that have happened to me so you will we're going to go into housekeeping now and as I said be be prepared and be dressed up and be ready to approach it 
even if it looks like you are headed for a cleaning up an old barn, even that if that's what your house looks like, at least be dressed for it because it gives the job dignity. Now, even in uh, the commercial world where people work uh, for the public and they uh, work in um, big box stores and stuff, they still have to wear a uh, uniform, they still have to get dressed, and even if the, I noticed there was one of our stores that was moving from one location to another, all the employees still had to get dressed and look like normal employees and look ready for the job and um, keep their time card and so you know just because there's going to be upheaval in your life maybe moving or maybe uh, shifting a room around or changing one room to the other and it's a big mess uh, we still should be dressed up we still should look pleasant and do stop every now and then uh, and sit down and have a cup of tea and also I wanted to tell you something that you might be if you're new to homemaking you might end up wondering how in the world you ended up with a junk drawer or with a room that uh, never could get cleaned up because it was a storage room and then later on it was turned into a bedroom and you still had storage in it well this is what happens to everybody they don't always tell you this but you do end up with these things and everybody has them at one time or other and it's, sometimes it will take be a struggle to get it cleaned up but it's always a goal there and uh, not to be um, daunted by it and not to be upset by it I have such a place in my house we have a garage that was turned into a bedroom it has a very nice floor beautiful windows but it stayed uh, the garage stuff kind of stayed in there for a while so I'm just sorting through it and kind of keeping the bedroom separate trying to give it a little more dignity and uh, so but I'm keeping at it and I'm when I feel like that I'm not getting anywhere, I'll move on to another room or some other task. And uh, Mr. S, of course, he's got this technique that he will spend 20 minutes cleaning up his office and that's it. And then he'll go on to another task that he has to do, publishing or writing or whatever he does. And he actually gets more done than I do because he doesn't seem to think he has to have a full day to do something. He just is happy to spend a few minutes on it and he gets somewhere eventually that's something that I'm learning to do and I think a lot of it goes back to my sewing when I was a teenager I learned to sew and I was able to take a whole day and sew because of course I was living at home with my family and I uh, I did have my jobs but it was all shared and so I wasn't in charge of the house and so I could spend a whole day and I could finish something well now I can't and um, it's, it's forever frustrating trying to get that day off to do the one thing and so I really do believe in the 20 minute idea is a very good one I've seen people actually get things done with that so so now housekeeping uh, don't ever you will think don't, but don't ever think that other people don't have those problems other people don't have um, ants in their house you know you might think no one has ants in the house but you know the bible talks about the spider and the ant and say, say that it it's not uh, particular where it goes and it can be just as at home in a rich person's house <laughs> that has a maid then it, it would be in our ordinary homes and so you're always going to have those problems and everyone has them also you might think nobody accumulates like I do well that might not be true at all because uh, things come in bulk and things come in in packages of more than one and sometimes um, we, we end up with things that we just didn't never intended to have or maybe uh, for some reason or other there has been illness in the family and we couldn't attend to culling and putting things away there are just all kinds of interruptions and so don't ever think that other people don't have these problems they do so now when you feel that your house is in decline that's the time to be an ex be excellent that's the time to, to bring up your excellence anytime you think of the word uh, defeat or decline that has to be a signal to to step up your excellence that's success and so I wish for you great success in your home making because the, when you do that you'll be giving your family um, the gift and yourself giving yourself the gift 
of an organized and clean house. And you will find that the more organized you are, the more orderly you are, the more you fold and clean and clean out a drawer and sort, and the more balanced your mind becomes. In fact, it's been highly recommended um, to people who uh, have confusion in their life or who um, tend to get anxious to sort something, to clean out something. Um, one thing I want to warn you about, if you have books like I do, don't unload that whole bookshelf and think that you're just going to put that all back together. Books are very different. Just take a few of them out at a time, look at them, dust them off, check them over, and uh, sort them into giveaway or keep, and then um, clean out the little area that they were in, dust the little shelf, and just do a little bit at a time because if you get all those books out, they're going to be out and on the floor maybe for six months if you have a lot, like a floor-to-ceiling shelf. The same with anything else that you want to keep. Just do a little at a time, and you'll get somewhere eventually. And this all uh, homemaking is you might not know anyone uh, over the fence or down the street or anyone that you have any com anything in common with or any homemakers that can give you any kind of uh, encouragement, but uh, you can become a pioneer in it. And uh, you can become your own hotline. <laughs> when you come across a homemaking difficulty or a problem, you can create your own solutions to everything. And one of the things about homemaking that a lot of you will come to understand is that it's a self-employed type of occupation and if you've never understood self-employment well you do now because you're going to be carefully guarding uh, how the house is cared for how the money is spent how the products you buy are used and that there's no waste and that you can uh, keep as much of your money as you want to if you determine uh, how do you, how it's used and there uh, it's just a an entirely uh, independent way of living and so you're in charge of it and you can make your house a more valuable piece of property or make all your possessions more valuable by the way you look after them so I talked to you uh, this morning earlier about your appearance being more polished well you can take care of your house that way too you can make it just more polished and any kind of discouragement that you face is just an opportunity to succeed just remember that, that it's just a step away from discouragement to success. And don't look at it as something that's going to win or beat you down. Look at it as something that you are going to overcome and that you're going to defeat, whether it's a mess in, quote, that room, <laughs> or whether it is something that you just haven't gotten around to doing or something you feel you're quite uh, overwhelmed and behind in. Look at it as a challenge, as a mountain to climb, as something to succeed in. So, you know, I have told you before about a an athlete who runs, and the Bible talks about this too, but uh, my own observation of athletes when you're watching something uh, like a, a race, you know, a local race or even uh, the Olympics, these athletes don't look around to see what everyone is uh, thinking of them or whether they're looking at them or whether um, they don't look at the crowd. They, they actually don't even look at the other athletes. They just look at the finish line. And that's what we need to do. We don't need to be looking around trying to get some kind of encouragement for this because it's possible uh, that people will take that wrong when you need encouragement and say something very negative like... Um, well, if this is the way homemaking is, I don't want anything to do with it because, look, she's always discouraged. You have to be careful what you say to people, and I've mentioned that before in previous videos. So be a pioneer. Every problem presents a, a pioneer opportunity. You know, we've talked about how there doesn't seem to be that pioneer spirit anymore because everything's been discovered. All the land has been settled, apparently, and but that's not exactly true. There are many things. There's there's many um, wildernesses and um, places to uh, to conquer and in in just ordinary life, you know. 
and there are new things that can be invented and there's no end to it and every family is different and has different needs and I heard about a, a couple of uh, friends of ours that her husband was always wanted to be an inventor he was always inventing something and uh, so he would make little little buttons or tags that would fit on things that uh, would tell when the last time they used it or when they bought it or just just for fun because that's what he liked to do and there's just so much you know but it kept his mind active and kept his inventive skills going and there are so many things you know that can be invented in the home and um, so now I have talked I have spoken for 25 minutes and I want to show you a book and then I'm going to talk a little bit uh, it's a dreary day and it's very dark outside so if you're not seeing very well in here that's because actually you don't need to be looking at me or watching me but uh, that's why it's one of those dark foggy days I can get this book out here I'll show it to you um, the book I told you about last time for those of you who like to sew or like to draw and design clothes you know that's another pioneer area every every generation needs these pioneer people who design clothing and design it to look nice and um, to keep it fresh and so this was called the book of looks by by Lorraine Johnson I'll put a picture of that on my blog and I bought this in 19 um, <laughs> I'll find it here I don't see a, it's I just don't see a date on it for some reason. I honestly don't see a date on it. I see the author's um, name, and but I don't see. A, but I bought it in 1982, I believe, or maybe three, somewhere along that line. Usually, there. Oh, it's 1983. I was right. 1983 the book of looks by Lorraine Johnson now the reason I bought this is because I like textiles I like design I like to sh I like to sew and I like to get ideas and um, I enjoy patterns and I will often just draw what I want to make and then go try to find a pattern that's nearest to what I want and I'll pick out a sleeve from one pattern or um, a bodice from another pattern so today I wanted to show you some of this but first I'll show you my favorite uh, ones which were very much like some of the Laura Ashley that you now Laura Ashley was publishing patterns and creating garments for sale from way back from even the 1960s I believe and it might it might have even been earlier but this was one of the ones that was in the book it's not a Laura Ashley but it's one of the ones that this designer had drawn in the in the book the book of looks and uh, I'll get a picture of that for you too for my blog but it's uh, she tells how to put together a certain look and she says um, this is called the shepherdess and she said don't despair if you haven't got a pasture or a or a flock of sheep that are tame you can still look the part the shepherdess is the perfect look for halcyon summer days when your thoughts turn to the wholesome outdoor life this is a look for the young at heart and for those who like all things sweet. Um, the look is pretty as a picture and can be a little complicated because of the layers because she mentions that you can actually wear she um, you can wear a, a skirt under a skirt you know you can wear a skirt for a petticoat it doesn't have to be like a real petticoat with lace on it and she talked about these layers and um, I believe that I do have a pattern that's similar to this but I never did get around to making it I just mostly liked looking at it so she said when you choose to dress like this remember that nothing is too pretty go for pastels or for prints and carry a straw handbag and uh, so I just that was quite appealing it had a little hat and a pair of socks that had also had lace on it you can get those socks you know with the with the lace around them you can get those I've seen them in some stores and also you can order them online so I wanted to show you another one that I was quite intrigued about I will just read the titles of these designs here that she has made now you have to be a mature individual to read this book or to look through it and because there are going to be some things that seem very outrageous 
but uh, we'll just take the ones we like. And that's what I've always done with books, okay? The Arabian, the American Indian, the Ava Tricks, the businesswoman, the castaway, the classicist, the Cossack. Now, I'm going to go look at that one because that was very, and the cowgirl. I wanted to look at that one um, because it was very colorful. I don't know if they call them the Cossacks or the Cossacks. I don't know. And um, so I'm going to find that. So I wanted to show you the cowgirl and this one. So, And this was called the Cossack. And it says here, there's a picture there. Isn't that colorful? And I love all the loose cloth. I love textiles. It says, the Cossack comes straight from the windswept steppes of Russia. The landscape is vast and dramatic. The winter long and bitter, and the clothing reflects both. Um, you know, color, the clothing is so colorful. The Slavs are an expansive people. Their garments are expressive in, in lush colorings and bright embroidery against the somber uh, dark browns and blacks. The Cossack is an intensely romantic look, look despite its original practicality. It comes to us in the West via some films and uh, that, are, that feature exotic theatrical versions of this look. And it talks about, uh, it says, choose days, choose skirts that are gathered or softly pleated from a wide waistband in thick woven fabrics or brushed cotton and felt. Corduroy is not so effective, but if soft and the skirt generously cut, it can work too. And allow your imagination to range when thinking of embroidery. So it goes on to talk about this kind of look here. I often was able to find patterns to go with my favorite looks. And the other one was the cowgirl, which is absolutely Western wear. You just can't beat it. It's so practical. Great for the home and great for outdoors as well. So the background. Um, there are really two cowgirl looks. The authentic version consists of the blue denim clothing, warm long sleeve shirts, and a sensible boot with the two to three inch heel that is designed to stay in the stirrup. But with the advent of the modern cowgirl, uh, they go on to say that jeans are worn and denim skirts are worn that can have, uh, you know, embroidery on them or ruffles and other things. So, so it's a natural fiber. It mentions that it's a natural fiber. That's what's fun about it. That's what I like about it is the natural fiber. And so as I flip through here, I'll show you a few more looks and then we'll go on to talking about people. And uh, I gave it away, didn't I? So you're all going to be scrolling through to that last end there. <laughs> so this one was called... Um, trying to find one here. This one was called The Lady, and it kind of goes back to the, I would suggest, uh, 1940s maybe. And um, I did find patterns that, that looked kind of like that. It says, um, Princess Grace and the Princess of Wales and several other ladies are the counterpart for this. And... Um, so it's just a, a subdued look that's very, very um, soft and feminine. So if you are interested in this and you are a sewist and you like to uh, have just different ideas, this one is very, they even have in one of these uh, suggested hairstyles to go with uh, these looks if you're interested. Now, what, the reason I bought it, I found that a lot of these types of designs worked really well with the home, really looked very well. And you know, if you have a small child and uh, you're wearing a skirt that has a pretty print on it, sometimes I would make something with uh, baby fabrics that found in the baby section of the uh, fabric store, have little uh, kittens on it or animals or a little house or something, or print, a repeat print. And uh, the children like to lay on my lap and fall asleep looking at the, the print on the skirt. Or if I was walking around, they'd hang on to my skirt and they really liked uh, they really liked the print. And so we need to think about, you know, what we're doing 
for others when we dress and what they're seeing, uh, how we're making life better for them too. So now I'm going to go on to the, um, well, let me go into a little bit for some of you that are homeschooling. That homeschooling, I have been thinking about it this week, and that is it would have been better for me. All of us have, you know, this retrospect going on from our homeschool days, things we would have done differently had we known better. It would have been better for me to have focused on my children's history, their personal history from their family, from both sides of their family, to, to give them a sense of how they came to be here and, and who their um, forebears were and what they did. And it's kind of inspiring. You know, it always inspires you to know that your grandfather settled something or did something. And uh, it would have been good for them to know. Of course, now with DNA, we're finding out mo even more and it might be easier for some of you. Uh, it was harder, a little harder to get the information when my children were growing up because our the grandparents were still living their um, their own life and um, were fairly young, and they didn't, I think, feel that there was much history to tell. But uh, that is one thing I would have done differently. Instead of having uh, too much world history, I would have told a lot more of our own local history, the history of the town we're living in or the state we're living in. I, I think that that's really, really important. And as I told some of you before, in America, it's strong states' rights. See, here's the thing with the, um, with the politics. There's one party that believes in strong states' rights. In other words, the state decides how things will be run in a state. And our governor that we elect is the same as our president. It's, it's the president of the state. And uh, we have our own Congress for each state. And the states decide uh, what will be allowed and what will not be allowed and what, what must be progressed in and what, much, you know, what would be helpful for the state and how money will be spent. And then there's another uh, political view that uh, we should have a strong central government and that the central government should dictate to all the states. And so, uh, of course, the side that I'm on is the strong states, right? However, we do appreciate and acknowledge that we must have a central government or there could be uh, maybe something going on in a state that's endangering uh, people's freedom and that the central government would have to step in. But uh, one of the things that I think would have helped for homeschooling is to focus on our state history. And I know that most of you probably don't even know who your Secretary of State is in your state. But we all know, who, you know about Washington, D.C. because, of course, the media just promotes it constantly. You can't help but, but know about it. But how many of you know who your local sheriff is or who your... Uh, town manager is, or city manager, or who uh, who's on the city council, or who uh, your police chief is. Do you know who your local judges are? We probably don't know anything about these people. And um, even our governor, we need to know more about our governor. And, you know, what do they stand for? What do they believe? And focus more on that because those are the people that can affect your life at your address. The president can't come to your door. And uh, nobody in Washington, D.C. can arrest you, but your local sheriff can. So you need to know who these people are so that you um, are aware of what they believe, what they, uh, what they will do, and how they view their job and how they view you as a citizen and the government. Now, in our state, we hire our own and elect our own local um, sheriff and and uh, chief of police and that sort of thing, uh, except in some instances. So we would know who they are um, and be able to interview them. But uh, for the most part, you know, sometimes these politicians are hiding and they can't be found to interview or to talk to. And I remember one time we voted for a judge in our state simply because he had the honesty to have a website, get on the web, and who he would talk to you uh, via uh, social media. And so that impressed us because it was the first judge we ever could really locate to figure out, you know, who is this guy? And so we, uh, we have a local government. We need to pay attention to that, ladies, because while everyone's stressing over 
what wash people in Washington D.C. are doing and people in the House of Representatives are doing or the Senate of the uh, central government, you're missing out on what's going on in your own state with your own Senate, your own House of Representatives. Each state has a House of Representatives and a Senate, and you're missing out. Uh, and they could be getting away with a lot of things that you don't believe in. So we need to be thinking about that. And that will that affects your uh, local taxes. That affects how things um, things are run on the land around you. And so that really needs to be looked at. And uh, don't let the media blow up the central government so much uh, in, in importance that you miss out on what's going on locally. You need to know what's going on locally with your local politicians. Okay. So now let's talk about seeing ahead. I'm probably going to make it to an hour because I got uh, 20 minutes left and I know that I wanted to talk about seeing ahead. So we're going to talk about people for a little bit. Now there are some people who just don't see ahead. They just don't, they only see what's blankly in front of them and they can't see, they don't understand the word purpose. They don't understand the word uh, uh, idea, dreams, or goals. They only see what's happening right now and they don't think it can get any better and they don't understand that you have to start somewhere to make something of of a life. Now, for example, when we moved here, uh, it was such a dismal place and uh, it was dark and the house was in bad bad repair but uh, and it was very depressing so of course we came in the evening and uh, and your mind is kind of ready to shut down anyway so you can kind of go into a mental slump the next morning uh, we all said okay what can we do what can we do to make it better in here and uh, mr. s said well whatever you want uh, go to Walmart and get it from paint to curtains to furniture and because we want to get it settled and be as happy as we can as quickly as we can and so uh, I began to think of it as what, a, what an opportunity. Take an old rundown cottage and turn it into something cute or livable or comfortable and warm and, um, and, don't, uh, and, and have an idea. Now we need to teach our children this too, that they need to be able to see ahead. Like if they have an idea or they have something that needs to be done, uh, instead of looking at something that's undone, go and fix it. And the best, most healthy minds are those that like to fix things, those that like to uh, make things better for them and for their family. So don't get um, into a mindset where you can't see ahead. None of us can actually see ahead. We really don't know, you know how long we're going to be in a certain place or whether we're going to stay in this place. But um, we can fix it up as though we are looking ahead. Now, the reason I brought that up is because there are people who are so contradictory and who hastily will tell you why something cannot be done and who will talk back. We used to call it talking back, and it was considered very rude. They'll talk back to you harshly, quickly, uh, hasty, sharp replies, and contradict everything you say. And part of the reason is, they can't see it. They can't see ahead. They they don't want to consider it. And it's not like you're trying to involve them, but we all know who these people are. They'll, you might, uh, they'll ask you how you are and you'll say, I'm fine. And they'll ask you what you're doing. Oh, I'm fine. I'm um, remodeling a, uh, a room or re redoing a cabinet or I'm sewing. And they will tell you why that's not a good idea and why that can't be done because they don't want to consider it. They don't want to see ahead and they can't see ahead. And they are somehow gotten in the habit of uh, knocking everything down, Any cons anything that's constructive, knocking it down in the eyes of someone else so that they won't see it either. That is a strange way to live, I think. But if you find yourself doing that, then stop and try to correct that habit write down or make a note of every time you are contradictory or uh, you're focusing on why something can't work. Uh, even, it shows that you cannot see any hope and you can't see the future. Of course we can't see the future, but uh, we have to have hope. And even if nothing ever changes and you can never solve anything, at least keep hope alive and think about it. Keep it in your mind. Keep 
the ideas in your mind, keep your goals in your mind, keep your dreams in your mind. Maybe you will never solve them, but you've got to have something that will make, um, that will lift you up and keep your um, ambition going. And in the home, this is really important. And it seems like it's the place that people want to most quickly put you down is at home. Even members of your own family might be doing that. So, um, so people who contradict or hastily say why something is impossible are saying they don't want you to do it and they don't want to consider it. So be careful what you share with people. If you've discovered that these people, uh, when we're talking about getting along with people section here, the one that you scrolled forward to <laughs> without listening to the housework part, is uh, that there are two things I wanted to add to this part about people who contradict all the time. Never People that are argumentative, uh, is are a real problem that you cannot seem to to have any kind of interaction with them without them starting an argument where they're arguing back to you and what I've often done is just not answer back you know because that's the way an argument stops is just don't answer it back uh, and let them win just let them win every time but there are some people that can't do that because they believe that we shouldn't uh, let people get away with um, telling a falsehood or giving a false narrative so we correct them. I don't do that if I if I don't feel the energy enough. I, I don't want to wear myself out trying to prove something to someone and it just doesn't matter to me. I won't. Uh, so I understand, you know, if you do tend to get into some kind of a conflict with someone because they're so argumentative, um, that's a hard one. Uh, so what I would like to say is there are a number of reasons why people are argumentative, why they are contradictory, and one is they could feel competitive with you. They could feel jealous of you. They could feel that um, you're getting ahead of them or you're going to make something of your life and leave them behind. And they want everything, everybody to be the same or to be equal. And that's, that's one of the problems. And the other thing is we've got people around that um, – are not qualified, but they try to analyze you. They, maybe they've uh, just met you for a little while, and maybe you said something <clears throat> amusing. So they said, uh, you just make fun of everything, or you just like to stir the pot, or whatever, and they've misdiagnosed you. They've misanalyzed. We've got all these amateur therapists going around trying to tell you what, what kind of person, trying to peg you, trying to um, analyze you and uh, define your personality. But then you might not be like that. Maybe you were just that way once, and they decided that's the way you were. And um, um, things that you uh, don't like to do, maybe they'll say, ah, oh, she's the girl that doesn't like to do such and such. Well, maybe you've moved on. Maybe there's something else you don't like, and maybe that doesn't matter to you anymore. But there are these people that go around trying to analyze you. So um, some of you might not ever 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 have that problem as a homemaker but for some reason homemakers look like uh, targets to some people because they are not under a big um, I'm, I'm going to say complicated system of um, hierarchy you know where there's there's a, a manager and then there's a manager of the manager and there's somebody else and so they're all sitting in this position and doing what they should do the homemaker is free and she is creative and she can be very happy and some people just don't like that they want that they want to uh, make her life more strict in their view and so they'll analyze her or they will say they'll be critical very critical the same people that are always contradicting are often very critical people because they always have to be critical of her and um, because they will think that She's obligated to live a certain way, and especially some of us who go by the Bible and we know that homemakers are supposed to guide and guard the home, they will find a crack in that. They'll find a way in which you have been a hypocrite, or they will call you a liar. And I have noticed two words that these um, naysayers and contradictors and critics love. They love two words, and one of them is behavior, and the other one is liar. So they will say, uh, after a while, your behavior um, 
means has shown that you are uh, not dependable or you're a liar. And of course, whenever we hear that word behavior, we feel like we're just little kids, don't we? Don't don't you think when someone talks to you about behavior, your behavior, you feel like you're being treated like a little kid? And then they'll use the word liar because that appeals to your conscience and you start having a guilty conscience even when you haven't done anything. And a lot of times you'll be called a liar just by being very honest. You have said something that is true that's different than the narrative they want to believe and different than, I guess, the media um, is portraying. And you you just said, oh, I don't believe it. I'm not sure about it. And they'll think you are a liar. And they love to use that word. Well, I was taught when I was growing up that a person who's always suspicious that someone else is lying are often liars themselves. So, of course, naturally, they wouldn't think anyone else was very truthful either. They know the inside of it, don't they? Or a person that was a thief, that was always lifting something or taking something, was always going to be suspicious that you had taken something from them or that other people were always out to get them, always out to steal something. Or a person who had um, maligned someone's character um, was always very sensitive uh, that their own character was being maligned or that you were uh, uh, not uh, a person that's that's not very um, uh, supportive of other people are always very sensitive that they're not being honored that they're not being supported that they're not being praised and that's very immature that's just plain immature and we have that kind of thing now as far as the argumentative person or the person that's always they never can really. Um, they never can really fix anything, solve anything, or um, be quiet and leave people alone. <laughs> and and I've we learn this when we're children. If this is not corrected when you're children, um, that's probably what happens in business. Sometimes you get people who are workers that are employer employees who cause trouble to the other employees, and. Um, a lot of this needs to be corrected at home when they're young. And so you get someone who contradicts or hastily, constantly wants to get an argument. One thing that we need to look at that we never want to, we never want to admit this, but, you know, never overlook the possibility that this person is on some kind of pharmaceutical or a drug or a, a prescription those, those can alter uh, people's thinking and can alter their reasoning quite a bit or just partaking of alcohol and never un overlook that possibility that that could be part of the problem. You know, sometimes a person who seemed to be completely normal will suddenly have a big blow up and yell and, and uh, be kind of out of character completely from what you knew them to be never overlook the possibility that they might have been drinking. They're very good at hiding it, you know. And uh, I have said before about drinking that it, um, it even one drink takes away some of your good judgment. And so, uh, so and of course, <laughs> it is the strangest thing because how, how do they know what they're doing? They actually don't know what they're doing. Sometimes they're just kind of, in a, in a daze kind of out of, of their mind and out of touch with what they're doing and may not even remember it. So I wanted to also mention something about cheerfulness. Now we try to be positive. We try to be, excuse me, I just have a piece of tape on my hand and that's because I had a little skin problem and um, I heard that if you put duct tape on it, it would help it and it has. So I've got a piece of duct tape on it today. And um, I have very thin skin. As a matter of fact, when I did my DNA, I got in touch with a lot of uh, unknown um, cousins, you know, second, third, and fourth cousins. They all said they had the same problem with their skin. And so I want to talk a little bit about cheerfulness, too, because it is not good to be cheerful when uh, it's not appropriate. And someone's having a problem and they can't fix something or they're kind of having a even a child at home and they're having a meltdown down it doesn't help 
to uh, yell at them and tell them to straighten up. You've got to be somewhat sympathetic and say, I know, honey, it's hard. Yes, that is very hard. I understand how hard that is. Let's see how we can fix it. And um, so with, with adults, cheerfulness can be a little obnoxious to some people who are having a terrible time. Like They're really having a rough time, and they're saying, I don't know what's going to become of my life. I've lost this, I've lost that, and I can't seem to get back on track. Don't just say, don't say cheer up. Say, that sounds very difficult. You know, because you've got to have, you've got to learn to give sympathy and empathy, which I think is hard for all of us if we haven't had a course in it or uh, our parents haven't set us down and told us how to be sympathetic when our brother or sister gets hurt or when someone's having a problem. I think this is really important. Sympathy and empathy are very important. But in being sympathetic and in being empathetic, realize that there will be some people who see you as very soft-hearted and will figure out ways to make you unhappy. And so those are the types I was talking about, the arguer, the contradictor, the um, naysayer, the one who likes to pour cold water on everything. These are the type of people you might come in contact with. And I know people, uh, if you've been working outside the home and you've had a regular steady job, you know those people are around all the time. Either they're the customer or they're one of the uh, fellow co-workers. And um, so you know who I'm talking about. And many times these people basically lack sympathy, empathy, or warmth towards uh, human beings and their the condition that they're in. And so if you realize that, um, realize also that because you are someone who wants to get something done, who wants a nice clean house, who wants to have a nice hot meal on the table, who wants to have polite children and a happy loving family, and who, who would like to have her family develop their talents, and who would like to have good days at home where uh, family and home are the home is a cheerful place and a nice place that somebody might try to thwart that and when we were little little and we were growing up we were told that anything if you're making any kind of uh, progress or improvement in your life somebody's going to try to um, attack you someone's going to try to knock it down it's just part of life if you realize that then you can keep on going on your goals and i'll tell you one thing that some people will do that will make it hard for you to continue on your goal. Let me just give you an example. Let's just say you want to paint uh, a painting, a picture, you know, to hang on the wall, and you're really into it, and you're really enthusiastic about it, and it's really absorbing, and it is uh, fulfilling, and you're working on it, and somebody comes along and makes a terrible remark about it and tells you that you're worthless and that you're wasting your time and that it's ugly and nobody's going to like it and you should be doing something more useful uh, and, and you can ignore that, but maybe they are determined to create a big blow up or an argument. I'm, I'm just using this as an example because when the argument and the blow up comes and these horrible uh, accusations begin uh, and it can be so disturbing that when the person leaves or when they're when they settle down and they're not there, the painting that you were doing has lost its, its allure, its luster. You, you don't want to go back to it because somehow you've associated that blow up, that argument with the painting. Well, these people know how to do that. They know how to humiliate you. They know how to grind you down so that uh, what, you're, what you're doing, you will stop doing. You will not make any progress because when you start to make progress, they will criticize it and not just criticize it in a way that you can shrug it off but create an issue over it. Create such an issue over it. You know, like have a meeting with you and um, tell you to your face uh, all your faults, like they have this list, you know, and uh, can discourage you so much that you'll quit, and that's how they work. And so that's something that may not ever happen. Hopefully, one of the ways you can prevent it from happening is not to share too much of your life with anybody who is contradictory, who is critical, and um, like don't share your plans and dreams with everybody if they're not on board, if they're not um, going to 
be able to um, help you uh, keep confident and fuel you, uh, don't share it with people who will who are destructive, who will tear it down. Don't share your plans and your dreams. Don't show people what you're doing. I read of a lady who had lived in the Victorian times, and she had um, her husband had been um, had had a relative like a, a brother who had been uh, in those days a lot of families extended families lived together in the same house but the brother had become very destructive and had um, uh, destroyed a lot of their uh, possessions and their family life and uh, just caused a lot of uh, grief amongst the family members he was very divisive amongst the family members and the woman of the house was secretly an artist and she began to make more paintings because it gave her uh, it relieved her stress and she made a lot of paintings and but she did not tell even uh, her, the closest members of her families because of this brother and she hid all the paintings inside the walls and in those days I don't know if you know about Victorian houses but many of them had uh, two walls um, together close together and uh, kind of like there's a pocket in there and uh, they said when the house was torn down many years later they people found all those paintings in there and she didn't really care if anyone ever saw them she only did it because it made her so happy and she wasn't trying to let anyone know but also she was protecting herself from the people that would destroy her enthusiasm for it okay so be careful what you tell people that is you can control some of these people just by being quiet about what you're doing you don't have to tell them everything if you're having a problem with people who are critics people who contradict constantly I know there are some people that uh, if you did them the nicest thing for them have them over for tea and uh, just stick to the weather remember um, Marianne's mother said Marianne if you can't say anything nice stick to the weather and you just say it's a lovely day they will say it's not you say the sky is blue they'll say not for long or it's not blue they would argue with anything and I mean they would argue with a rock they are just that uh, they have to because they think that's conversation and they have never been taught or trained how to speak this is something you can do at home to create good citizens and good citizenship is love your neighbor as yourself you know and love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. So ladies, I've been talking for an hour. I hope you got something out of it. Don't take it all too seriously, especially the people part, because that's my experience. Your experience might be different. You can also analyze things yourself by observing and um, being careful uh, around the people that discourage you the most. Find out you know, what it is and uh, try to back up to when the argument started to find out what was said and that way you can maybe avoid it and um, so ladies until then I hope you'll leave a comment because that's where I get my steam and thank you a uh, few of you have left um, left donations for me on my PayPal which is just such a thrill and uh, without that I couldn't have bought my teacup this week so I wanted to thank you so much for coming and um, I'll see you next time bye